Welcome to this lecture having to do with social capital. This lecture is part of the Environmental Management Studies course at Malmö University. If you are taking part in the course, then you know this is a continuation having to do with environmental management and human capital. Now this has to do with social capital. Social capital in organizations and the relationship to environmental management. My name is Joe Strahl, and I teach in the Environmental Studies program. If there happen to be advertisements during this YouTube video, I apologize. Hopefully this isn't too disturbing. So, again, this uh, lecture is part of MV 241E, uh, one, of the program, one, one of the courses in the Environmental Studies program at Malmö University. But if you happen to find this on YouTube, you're welcome to watch it, and it might give you a taste of some parts of the program about environmental management. To begin with, I'm going to be talking about what Lucas, in her article, uh, talks about the four different forms of capital which can exist in any organization, and she links these forms of capital, these forms of resources, if you'd like instead, to environmental progress, environmental performance, and environmental management in any organization but particularly in companies. As opposed to human capital, which is very individual-centered, she speaks about social capital, and you can read more about the distinction she makes in the article. Now, when it comes to social capital, she is referring to the collaboration and interaction between individuals. And this doesn't necessarily have to be formal collaboration intera interaction, it can be informal. <clears throat> How this takes place is based on the culture in the organization, the initiative which individual employees take, or groups of employees take, and what's encouraged, as well as the formal way the organization is organized. We can see that in her way of thinking that uh, social capital is somewhere existing in the borderline or the border area between organizational capital and human capital. Now, in her article in Business Strategy and Environment uh, from a number of years ago, I'm recording this in 2020, uh, she speaks of the four different kinds of uh, resources or capital, and she distributes the various kinds of environmental management practices, or EMP, among these four main categories. And today I'm talking about social capital. And we can see, based on her table, that she's divided Roman numeral three into, of social capital into A, B, and C, uh, and something has uh, blocked here, unfortunately. We'll get to that in a moment. A has to do with uh, product design or echo uh, design. B is green supply chain management, and C is other. And among other is technological research alliances or partnership for environmental preservation, which is partly covered here. Uh, presumably um, a CSR or CSR-like kind of initiative which takes place among several different organizations uh, would be something which would be fall under social capital uh, because it would be groups of people from the parent company together with groups of people from other companies that would be involved in the CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, or CSR-like kind of activities. So environmental management practices that fall into social capital in general, they would involve investments, investments in, in time, in money, and other kinds of resources. So that environmental knowledge within um, and uh, environmental knowledge within the organization, which occurs or is created or is distributed because of interactions between employees or between the networks within the organization, which are either formal construct constructs or could perhaps be informal and irregular forms of networks. There are formal in -rela uh, relationships that exist between individuals and teams within uh, the company, within the organization, but they could also have linkages to stakeholders, stakeholders outside the company in some way. In some cases, the relationships per se need to be developed as a form of developing of uh, social capital. And you need to decide which norms are going to be valid and correct when we build up this form of collaboration. 
So what does Marilyn Lucas mean by social capital and investments in social capital as opposed to human capital, organizational capital, and physical capital? When she refers to those environmental management practices which are classified by her as social capital, she's talking about investments which enhance environmental knowledge within the organization. And this knowledge is available widely available to large numbers of employees. It also comes to its use in interactions between employees. Human capital in the individual has a value, but it becomes even more, in, more valuable when that knowledge is shared in a social fashion and becomes, or at least some of it becomes, uh, social capital. These interactions can be, uh, that take place formally, uh, informal relate, uh, arrangements, or there could be informal or everyday uh, interactions which take place between employees that the organization didn't originally intend to occur. In some cases, uh, the, the social capital also involves individuals or groups of individuals in Company A, say our company, uh, that are involved with individuals or groups of individuals in other companies where there is some sort of collaborative exercise for some reason and where environmental and sustainability matters are included in this collaboration between companies. So this means this is some sort of social capital. It's something which is available within the, in our case, company A, uh, and also that way involved in, or available in other companies. Lucas makes a distinction between two different kinds of um, social capital within organizations. She talks about internal relationships and she talks about external relationships. When she's referring to the internal relations and social capital, she comes awfully close to what, what she otherwise means as organizational capital. So there are different functional areas in a company, at least that's the model of the way a company should be run these days. Uh, and there can be formal decisions about collect connections between the function areas, and then there arise informal decisions or networks about that. Some kind of coordination is going to be needed. Uh, and this could lead to changes in one part of the company, which leads to changes in other parts and so forth. And the information is sort of transformed from one part, one function to another part of the company. The functional areas can also be linked to the physical flows. If we think of a manufacturing facility, that there are a number of different steps and that those could then be integrated together. Something which, or, or um, practices, environmental management practices, which Marilyn Lucas includes in social capital, she thinks of design for environment, um, which is a process, uh, and she thinks about life cycle analysis or life cycle assessment, which uh, can be considered to be more of a software tool, uh, and she has these as examples. Uh, and that's her way of classifying environmental management practices, you or others might want to classify them a different way. And sometimes, as I said before, these can be informal temporary arrangements. And sometimes if we take the tool LCA, uh, it can be just seen as a tool. That's the way I tend to look at it. Um, and is not a way to promote new kinds of relationships and understanding. Because if we have an LCA study, or initial LCA study, it might require input from different people with different functions in the company, and then they are looking at the results together, perhaps, facilitating communication with them. So the result of the LCA study seen in this way isn't uh, that this product leads to X ton of emissions. The result is that people who haven't been talking to each other are now doing that in the interest of reducing the total environmental impact of the product from the company. Uh, this could lead to some sort of changes that these informal contacts become more important and they become systematized. And this could ultimately, perhaps after some time, lead to some changes in the company and the way the company is organized. If we look at the external relationships, 
Usually this comes after the insight in a company that we will not be able to solve all of our environmental problems by ourselves. Some of them are more internal. We can fix those. Others are going to need, require collaboration with others in society, other stakeholders, be them collaborators or even competitors that we might need to collaborate with sometimes. Here um, we can think about what is sometimes referred to as in business management or business economics as the value chain. That would be logical to collaborate along that chain. Uh, and this has to do with the physical resources as there are one company does something as a raw material and then there are more changes made to that and there are more changes and so forth. And then ultimately at the end, the final company, which is going to sell something in the computer, together with all these other changes along the way, has increased value and it's something very valuable. This is called the value chain. When we look at the environment, we could consider this to be what could be called instead life cycle leadership. We are an important company along a value chain and we want to lead in the area of the environment. We take certain decisions which influences the rest of the value chain or we take certain key decisions together with important uh, organizations in the value chain. We are leading the reduction of environmental impacts of the product from its entire life cycle. Uh, and in other courses, we'll talk more about uh, life cycles designed for environment, uh, the environmental impacts of products, life cycle assessment, etc. When we have these external, external relationships, then something that in the past was nobody's problem, but was also everybody's problem, we might feel like, well, nothing's going to happen, so we need to do something for our environmental work uh, and for our credibility, our prestige, and our legitimacy to talk about environmental matters. We also are interested usually in finding out what our stakeholders really care about the environment. Uh, and uh, and that these external relations are something that could be very interesting for companies to learn. You may think that, that stakeholders think about the environment in some way, but maybe they don't. We internally may think, based on some studies, that this and this and this are the main environmental problems. The stakeholders may agree on this, but have some completely different idea about something else, which we semi-objectively might think of, well, that's really not all that big of a problem compared to the others, but okay, we need to have good relations with our stakeholders, so we will work with that, while we perhaps try to convince them that it might not be as big a problem as you think it is. So all of these things that, that occur could lead to some internal changes, and could also lead to some changes in our relationships with our stakeholders by engaging with them in the area of the environment. Uh, now I showed a picture before with uh, the, some of the table uh, under the environmental management practices that Lucas places under social capital, Roman numeral three, A, B, and C with various subcategories there. I'm going to be talking briefly about, and I've been talking about uh, some of these and I'm going to come back to them, those that are in purple. Um, and I'm also going to bring up learning organizations and organizational learning in connection with this, which is some, not something which Lucas brings up, uh, but this is important to consider in relationship to her article and environmental management in general. Uh, and then I have marked in green here, something called green supply chain management. I'm not going to bring anything up in this lecture, but you might find that there's a lecture about that at some other point in the environmental studies program at Malmö University at some point in time. Uh, the other points I'm not going to bring up. It's impossible to cover everything in detail from, uh, from that article. There is the idea that can be seen in all kinds of literature about making changes in companies and particularly about making changes in the, in the goods and services which they produce and they sell on a market. When I say goods and services now, I'm going to shorten that down to products. 
because a service can be considered a product which is uh, being sold as well. Since some kind of environmental knowledge might be fragmentary in a company, that the various functions having to deal with everything from manufacturing to sales and services, that could be quite fragmentary. So it might be an idea to bring together representatives from the different functions and form environmental teams. These teams could be formalized and last for a number of years, or they could be ad hoc, lasting only for a number of months, or they could meet from time to time with people coming in and out of it. And you could have some sort of environmental manager who is calling these meetings or is in charge of calling these meetings and, and functions as some sort of chairperson during the meetings. Um, frequently we talk about cradle to cradle um, or supplier to the consumer or we could have the various functions in the company as I mentioned before. Somebody or several people need to represent all these steps and sort of be the environmental spokesperson for that step or those steps and to have communication with each other so that there's not just an emphasis on one step in the life of the product in terms of environmental work for a number of years but there's a holistic perspective perspective and based on this decisions can be made and a decision here might impact on another step so we want to gather knowledge as part of a particular project perhaps we put it together as something purposeful or permanent, or it could be much more ad hoc. And the end result is that different parts of the company are talking to each other that weren't doing that before, or they are talking to each other, but about things that they weren't talking about before, the environment. Now, besides environmental teams, this is sometimes referred to as a green team in a sort of uh, funny way like that. But it's also a good idea to try to make this a difference between any other kind of team that's formed. And by having a green team, it's the environment, vegetation, green leaves. But it's also go, like red, yellow, green traffic light, that something's going to be happening here. I mentioned this before. We could imagine the various kinds of functions in the company that could be represented in a green team. Um, we also might be finding it necessary to include functions uh, from outside the company. If we have outsourced certain things, but these things are necessary to include to get a handle on the entire impact of a, a product in during its entire life. So I've suggested that if repairs uh, were external, a daughter company, or maybe we're not involved in that at all, suppliers and customers, could also be considered as stakeholders that would need to be included in this green team, whereas these are perhaps more the internal, more obvious parts of the green team, but we would sort of adjunct those uh, representatives here. The more numbers of steps in the life cycle of a product which are included, the more likely that we're going to have a complete picture, the more likely we will, um, the more likely that we will be identify a number of environmental problems, rank them, prioritize them, and see how they perhaps are linked to each other. Investments in uh, R&D, research and development. Sometimes we don't think about this in relation to the environment, but Lucas suggests that this is important. I'd also suggest, I think it also depends upon which company the environment has often in the past been considered very peripheral to R&D activities in a large number of companies. Unless, of course, you're an environmental technology company, say, dealing with water purification, then environment and R&D are, are intimately linked together. That's how you're succeeding in the market. Innovating better uh, products for cleaning up or reducing risks or, or like that. But the vast majority of companies are not providing products for environmental technology. So this means, of course, that the environment might need to be considered more in R&D uh, activities. If you're an established service company, you're 
rather unlikely to have all that much research, but you may have a lot of development money being spent. So there's no pure research or applied research. You're just de further developing what you've been doing. In what we could refer to as mature branches, there might not be so much R&D taking place. Not much is happening. You have a stable customer base. You have small incremental changes, which might not require all that much investment in R&D. Uh, but if you have a less mature branch where there's a lot of technological development taking place, then you're probably spending a lot more money on research and development to continue to push things forward. And that might be an area where it would be easier to incorporate environmental concern into R&D activities because there's a lot going on and it's central to the survival and development of the company. With the environment in any organization, it means change. If nothing changes, then there's no change in environmental performance, or we have extremely shallow, narrow painting of a greenwash on it, and it looks like something's high changing, but really nothing is changing. So change suggests that some kind of R&D is going to be needed in our company. Yes, so this means that sometimes the environment can form as a, a catalyst to sort of shake up a company that hasn't been having all that much R&D and could be the sort of beginning of, of a reinvigorated research and development thanks to environmental concern. Sounds good. Now I said before that, uh, um, well, I had a picture before the table from Lucas, and I had at the very bottom in some sort of light purple uh, organizational learning or learning organizations. And what I'm going to be talking about in the next slides is as much something having to do with environmental management as it has to do with more traditional forms of business administration. Or at least it should. So it's a clear overlap between more traditional, non-environmental concerned uh, business management and environmental management. You could replace the phrase environmental management with sustainable development work or something like that. And the idea will be similar and relevant. To think about um, in, uh, learning, to think about learning and uh, organizational learning, we have to begin examining the company culture of the, co the company in question. And we can look at these points in the red box here. We can ask ourselves to what extent the company is a very strict hierarchy. We can ask ourselves to what question if, if it is less hierarchical. And we can see to what extent the company is organized more around the idea of a network. Even companies that come across as being flat have some kind of hierarchy, and companies that have a very formal, strict hierarchy are almost always going to have informal networks. So it's difficult to classify a company strictly as existing in just one of those categories. We can see it as a spectrum where maybe more of a, of, of a company is more in one part and more of another company is in another part. What else can we think about company culture? To what extent is the organization very linear, which is of course linked to a strict hierarchy? And to what extent do you have small groups that are more self-organizing that based on the overarching goals of the organization try to fulfill their own goals, which in turn achieve the vision for the company? And then finally, the question is, to what extent is the company open to stakeholders? And to what extent is the company closed to stakeholders? Now, no company is closed to stakeholders. It wouldn't be in business very long. Um, but some companies that may claim that they are open, they're not all that open. If they were, they would not be surprised by sudden uh, ideas that stakeholders have. And in the literature, there are scores, dozens of examples of companies that seem so surprised when suddenly there is an environmental interest on the part of a number of stakeholders, uh, whereas 
you really don't have to have your ear to the ground to get the vibrations and understand what's going on. So some companies may think they're open, but they're really not all that open. So what we can see from this is we see that there are some companies which are more innovative and others which are less innovative. Um, they can be in more innovative branches. Uh, recent or more past experiences. Um, an effort to achieve a new market share that failed is probably going to influence company culture. It might be more sort of conservative and, and retracting into itself. Uh, but successes might lead to more successes. In some companies, whoever was around and founded it, and if they were managing the company and owning the company during at least the first 5, 10, 15 years, their ideas put a profound influence on what is happening in the company even today, although this influence can wane or be reduced uh, as the company moves away from the original founding years. So there can be something which is very positive, which shines through, or after a while we could be seeing it more and more as some sort of a shadow being cast over us today, and we would like to get free of that and be able to do something new and different. On the other hand, if you have very well organized and innovative and progressive management and present, who's also thinking a bit more long term and not just the next quarter, and they feel that there's a need for a clear break in some of the founders' ideas, then this can be achieved. It will be difficult, there will be entrenched interests, but it's possible if you give it enough time and if you're clever about doing it. Who owns the company? Is it a family-owned company, which is probably small, or perhaps owned via a trust or a foundation? Is it instead a company which is owned in with shares, and does it have a variety of passive and active owners? This is going to influence company culture. How much do you need to generate cash on a quarterly basis to please the market? Or is this okay that it can take uh, longer? Uh, a family-owned business is probably thinking more in the long term, often because there's the idea of generations, that the next generation is going to take over and there might be another generation to take over, and therefore short-term profits aren't as important as the long-term legacy of the company. How much is being reinvested in the company, or how much is it being removed to pay dividends to the stockholders? And to what extent are employees' uh, knowledge and skills appreciated, valued, admitted that this is important? Um, and to what extent how do employees have a certain degree of autonomy? They are responsible, uh, but they have a degree of autonomy to achieve the goals that have been established. All of these points, and more, can affect the company. What can the company learn, and what does it want to learn? And in fact, does it even realize that it needs to learn something new? So we can see that this could affect, to some extent, whether a company is willing to reassess preconceived notions and ideas based on this new idea of sustainability, or to what extent the company is willing to make serious modifications in the way it's doing things to reduce its total environmental impact and set it off on a somewhat different trajectory. Or there's not all that much interest. We're just sort of putting new curtains up in the window that makes things look a little different and a little better. And hopefully customers will be enticed to buy from us when we actually haven't made all that many changes. A number of companies fall somewhere in between there, of course. To what when it comes to organizational learning, to what extent is a company willing to accept that there is a need for new knowledge, new experiences, and that the employees need to learn new things? Human capital, but also in terms of social capital. And that this might at some point even impact on the organizational structure of the organization. So do we need to unlearn certain things to then be able to learn new things and do things differently? It's not just a 
tweaking what we're already doing, but something more deep in this. To what extent is the learning experience and the practical results kept within the organization? Uh, to what extent learning is considered important in the organization? <clears throat> to what extent is learning considered an advantage for the organization, but also considered something that is a normal kind of activity? Of course, we're not learning necessarily things every day, but learning is important. And then there's a selection process. Among these various things that we learned, which ones are going to be incorporated into change? So we can see that sometimes a lot of learning takes place, but some of things are discarded. So even a learning organization is going to not consider all things that are learned as to be as important. And that may disappear after a while. To what extent is the new knowledge, the new ac activities, the new attitudes being diffused within the organization? Is it passive? Or is this so important that we actively make sure that that things um, become, that, that, that new things are learned by everyone in the organization. Now, I work in a university, and a number of universities around the world may be talking about being new and innovative and so forth, but sometimes certain things in, in universities are actually incredibly painfully slow in terms of learning new things. I would suggest that during the pandemic, that the <laughs> The potential to learn about teaching digitally has been learned very unevenly by people working in an institution of higher learning, which seems to be a bit of a paradox. But universities are innovative, but they're also incredibly conservative at the same time. Something for students to understand. So we can see that there could be some sort of a, a progression going from the top in my list, going down to the bottom, that uh, we have new forms of knowledge, new ways of organizing how we learn certain things, and this sort of goes down through the organization, uh, and that we reach a point where there's a decision about what is new that we have learned is that we're going to keep and what we're going to discard. And then to what extent all of this is actively or passively permitted to uh, be learned within the organization. We can make a connection back to the article by Lucas again in terms of organization by looking at human capital and social capital. On the left we see points one, two, and three. When it comes to this it's that individuals are learning something new. Uh, this could be the deliberate on the part of a important uh, management or decision maker to make sure that staff find it important and have the possibility to learn new things on an individual level. On the other hand, it could be number three, it could be the result of an individual herself or himself figuring that I really need to learn this regardless of what my most immediate manager thinks about this because this is important. And that also is because there's a, perhaps a bit of autonomy in the organization. If we switch to the other column, where the points A, B, and C under social capital, <clears throat> it only can become organizational learning when there is through some sort of active promotion or that there's no resistance to a passive diffusion of, of this new knowledge that one or more individuals have. So individual learning only becomes organizational learning um, if there is an act of promotion or passive diffusion is accepted. We could see this as taking place as part of a deliberate process, which would be linked into human capital, number two. Uh, or it could be linked downward. If there's realization that the company is going to lose valuable competence, if we lose an individual to a competitor, or if we don't take into consideration and give sufficient credit uh, to this person, or perhaps people working together as a small group in their new knowledge. Um, and we might even appoint other people to take care of that, to charge of those ideas and bypass and completely ignore showing our ignorance of that, of these people that have no experience. 
And uh, if, it's, if innovation is not something that's important in the company or in the subculture of a part of the company, then this isn't going to happen. Continuing with the idea of organizational learning, and we can see this from more than one perspective, I hope you could see. And if we instead turn it around here, sort of bottom up, I had another slide where it was a sort of a, a progression in the other direction. There are individuals that have learned new things, particular facts and so forth, and skills and attitudes and experiences that they have. <clears throat> and this can sometimes lead to a reflection on part of the individual. Uh, this means that there's some sort of learning, and then the individual reflects upon what she or he has learned. That's sort of a secondary uh, or more fundamental kind of learning. We can have groups or teams that do something similar to what we see below in the part, or part of the individual. So what this can lead to at some point is if there's time and if the organization thinks this is important, then this can, learn, this can lead to a reflection about we are learning new things, but we're also learning new things in a new way. Or our learning new things is leading us to think about learning new things in a new way. And that we can learn together, not just as individuals. We move up further in some kind of hierarchy. If we have larger numbers of individuals or teams, or formal, formal divisions that can act as a barrier. So instead of necessarily the, what we are learning, but it is that we are learning new things, we, uh, can lead to a transformation. Through us learning new things with new people, we are transformed in our connections within the company. And it was just sort of a vehicle, in this case, the environment, to make this sort of a change. And that we start to learn together when we didn't learn together before. And then we reach the sort of pinnacle, as this sort of continues to bubble up, that between different parts of the organization, company, or perhaps between companies, sharing and collaboration around learning leads to still more change and new ideas, new changes, new ideas, and perhaps new relationships. And this can lead to some sort of a positive spiral going upward. And that is what a lot of management literature talking about organizational learning thinks is, wow, now we're really moving forward when we find examples of that. Something which is talked about in some management literature and some organizational structures literature and so forth is the idea that we can learn from mistakes and that some of the most fundamental learning that we can have in an organization is in fact learning from mistakes. Mistakes can be serious. It becomes very important for us to learn from these. And it's not just a question of, in a sort of superficial way, learning from our mistakes, but there are a number of questions which need to be answered for us to be able to learn from our mistakes. How we see what is the mistake, what caused the mistake, to what extent this is a large problem or not, how likely the problem will occur again, can we solve the problem momentarily or not, can we make sure that this problem, will, this mistake, will not occur again, is the problem the mistake, or the problem something else in the mistake is that we tried to solve the problem the wrong way? And are there a series of similar mistakes that taken together seem to form some sort of a pattern, and maybe we need to identify this pattern better and work with that? So what I was talking about in the previous picture is what is sometimes referred to as double loop learning. The concept was first raised in an article from 1978. Um, and what I'm talking about is something which to us today may seem very obvious, but before 1978, it didn't have a term um, and its formal definition. So what we, um, what we do when we talk about double loop learning 
is that we not only correct mistakes, but we learn from our correction of mistakes. In, sing in single loop learning, an individual or an organization finds a mistake, solves the problem well enough, and then carries on as if nothing else had happened. The existing goals, the existing organization in our organization remains the same. When it comes to double loop learning, we find a mistake, just like before, or perhaps we become aware of a series of similar mistakes that form a pattern of some sort. The problems may seem unrelated, but on closer inspection, we realize that the problems are actually interrelated quite seriously. We then realize or learn from this that we might need to make some bigger changes in our organization to be successful. We might need to make changes in the way we see things, the priorities we make, how we are in turn organized for us to be successful. So we're not learning from our mistakes. Yes, we are in some ways but we're learning from our mistakes in how we were learning from our mistakes, if you get the point there. <clears throat> so single loop learning, it can be considered mistake correction, and that's very important. Sometimes the mistake is in isolation. Sometimes it's because there's a routine and somebody isn't following it well enough, and then we fix that problem by making sure the person follows the routine better. But when it comes to double loop learning, there's something more that's taking place there. It might lead to some sort of changes in an organization, and it might also lead to changes towards the future. Uh, it might change the structure of the organization. It might change how things are reported. It might change how routines are created. It might lead to the establishment of one or more teams if the environment is important here, green teams that didn't exist before, to see things in a more holistic fashion. This is what can be called as double loop learning. Now, if you have an organization which can't do this, then it's going to be a big problem. If they, unless they have a lot of loyal customers, uh, whatever. Here, this is perhaps the, those companies that last the longest and can reinvent themselves from time to time. Now, what does all this about double loop learning have to do with companies and the environment and environmental management? As I said before, working with the environment involves change. And environmental management in its best form, its mo most progressive kind of activity, is going to have to do with change. We've co we have created purposely or by mistake, environmental problems. And unless we make changes, those problems are going to continue to occur. What changes are required? How fundamental? That's something we can talk about or we can discuss further. But environmental management has to be about change. Otherwise, not much is happening. And many organizations don't like change, and there can be individuals and organizations that have invested time and effort in their career that things are going to stay like this and here comes somebody that wants to make a change. So there can be a lot of resistance there. Also, it has to do with change in how the organization views the environment and how it changes its relationship with various stakers, stakeholders, perhaps including the environment, if the environment is a stakeholder in and of itself. And then that means that there have to be changed relationships to customers, suppliers, and other actors in the market. Are they obvious? So thanks for sticking with me. I'm going to take a few slides from the Human Capital Lecture and a few slides from the Social Capital Lecture, and I'm going to re-show these uh, quickly, and I won't be talking. And you could sort of say to yourself, right, he said that, right, he said that. It's not a complete review, but very quickly. Um, and then it will be over. If you don't want to look at that, you can pause now, but you can also go back and look at anything that you think you missed or you want to watch again. So, 
I hope to see you in another part of the Environmental Studies program and in some sort of other course in the program. Thank mm -hmm. you.